Welcome, Dr. Ranga. Dr. Ranga is an Associate Professor and Vice Chair of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Creighton University School of Medicine. She's the Director of the Psychiatry and Child Adolescent Fellowship Programs at Creighton as well. She completed her medical training at Bangalore Medical College in India and then did a brief internship at the University of Venezburg. She completed her psychiatry residency and child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at the University of Missouri, Columbia. After her fellowship, she has garnered phenomenal experience and has led multiple different institutions. And she at Creighton currently is involved in the child psychiatry fellowship, intimately involved in teaching, especially mentoring trainees and helping them reach their goals in education while mindfully navigating their well-being. Dr. Ranga has worked at many levels of care in child psychiatry and enjoys outpatient work and building an alliance with children and families over time. Her clinical work is in the Child and Psychiatry Teaching Clinic at the Emanuel Center in Omaha, Nebraska. Welcome, Dr. Ranga, and I invite you to take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Sagar, Dr. Greenswig, and all of you for this kind invitation. It is such an opportunity and a privilege to be talking to my primary care colleagues today and a perfect timing given the month and uh, where we are with child and adolescent mental health in this country. I have no uh, disclosures to indicate. Learning objectives today are to describe the symptoms of depression in children and adolescents, generate and walk through differential diagnosis, and explain the steps in the assessment and management of depression. So start thinking about this case. Um, we're going to discuss him in more detail at the end. Jerry Rhodes is a 12 year old male. He's brought in by his mother due to decreased energy level and frequent headaches. When I was reflecting on how to best present to this group, I thought, that if I use the lens of what primary care has received um, and then add to that as a, my perspective as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, it may be useful to you. So I'm going to start with the GLAD PC, the Guidelines for Adolescent Depression in Primary Care, originally developed in 2007, and it was developed to address gap in practice between primary care and psychiatry. It was updated in 2018. Part one of the update focused on identification and part two of the update focused on treatment. I would recommend that you download and access a copy of the GLAD PC toolkit. It has some really neat tools, charts, guidelines. This is extremely helpful, but there are still many barriers to implementation. And one of the barriers is sort of the translational aspect in that a pediatric practice looks and functions very differently from a child and adolescent psychiatry practice going through the GLAD PC guidelines and adding my perspective as a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Part one is the focus is preparation, identification, assessment, and initial management. So what does that mean? Let's walk through the many phases of depression in children and adolescents. It's important to differentiate normal teenage moodiness. Also keep in mind that medical conditions, hypothyroidism, etc. can contribute to depressive symptomatology. Also important to think through substance use, medications that the child or the youth may be prescribed that may be contributing to the depressive symptomatology. And when that all is considered um, and ruled out, then you land potentially on a primary psychiatric diagnosis. Symptoms of depression in children and adolescents are very developmentally different from each other and from adults. So in the child, it presents as irritability, low frustration tolerance, losing temper quickly, temper outbursts, somatic complaints, headaches, stomach aches, hallucinations, social withdrawal, school refusal, separation anxiety, and increase in worry. So this is the child who becomes irritable, starts crying, get, having temper outbursts, feels, um, has a lot of aches and pains and socially withdraws. The adolescent may have an irritable mood or a depressed mood, melancholic features, suicidal behaviors, a low self-esteem, apathy and boredom, substance use, changes in weight and sleep, their grades may be falling, 
psychomotor depression. And this is really sort of when the body, the mind begin to slow down or speed up. Hypersomnia, aggression, antisocial behaviors, and social withdrawal. And social withdrawal is significant because the adolescent lives surrounded by validation from peers. So now we're gonna focus on the DSM-5 psychiatric diagnoses. And by no means is this exhaustive, but this is just a, a overview of the most important diagnoses that we work with. The first thing to consider is an adjustment disorder. So is there an event that was stressful after which, so within three months of which, mood symptoms developed? And this is time limited. And with the stressor off, then the symptoms remit within six months. So this sort of time limited response with moodiness, et cetera, to a stressor is an adjustment disorder. The next diagnostic consideration is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. So this is a fairly newer diagnosis in DSM-5. And this is associated with irritable mood, superimposed, behavioral or temper outburst. So this is the disruptive child who is chronically irritable. Um, what's important in this diagnosis is that oppositional defined disorder and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder cannot be diagnosed together. So disruptive mood dysregulation disorder trumps oppositional defined disorder. So what it appears to be is a disruptive, moody, irritable kid. Um, and these outbursts happen frequently and over several years. Major depressive disorder. So here I'm gonna focus on a couple of terms, major depressive episode and major depressive disorder. So I'm gonna define a major depressive episode. So an episode of major depression is a two week period during which you have five out of the nine symptoms that I'm going to describe. Two of those symptoms have to be either a mood related change, which is either depression or irritability or a loss of interest or pleasure. So the child begins to lose interest in activities. So one of those aspects plus several other symptoms, which is weight gain or loss, insomnia, hypersomnia, psychomotor agitation or retardation, fatigue, loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness, guilt. This is sort of that ruminative guilt uh, that people with depression experience, diminished ability to think, focus, concentrate, and recurrent thoughts of death. So what I've described over a two week period is a major depressive episode. Recurrence of these episodes constitutes a major depressive disorder. And major depressive disorder by definition is familial and very, very heavy and recurrent. DSM-5 always makes, uh, you know, makes it important to delineate that there's a problem with functioning and distress due to these symptoms and make sure that we rule out um, substance as well as medication, induced mood changes, as well as medical conditions. And in the course of a major depressive disorder, we want to never have experienced a hypomanic or a manic episode. Let's say somebody experiences a major depressive episode two to three times and then has a hypomanic or a manic episode. That's when we move the diagnosis to a bipolar spectrum disorder. So major depressive disorder, the prevalence is two to 4% and definitely increases in adolescence. So this is a heavy burden for society. This has to be distinguished from grief. In grief, it's more wave-like. So it's related to loss. The quality of mood is more emptiness. Grief is often intertwined with fond memories of the loved one. Grief circles around that loss. So the thoughts, the rumination, the guilt, the thoughts of death all circle around that loved one. Whereas in major depressive disorder, it's rumination about one's worthlessness and helplessness and hopelessness and dying because one doesn't deserve to live. So it has a very different heavier feel to it than grief. Now, of course, grief can seg into major depressive disorder. Persistent depressive disorder is formally referred to as dysthymic disorder. This is sort of a low-grade depression. So 
to meet criteria, the, the youth has to have a low grade depression for about one year. And what that means is an irritable mood with some other symptoms such as change in appetite and sleep and energy. What's different here is that there is no recurrent ruminative thoughts of death and the hedonistic aspect of life may still be preserved. However, just to confuse the whole picture, we can have major depressive disorder superimposed on persistent depressive disorder. So when the two of them occur together, it's a real heavy burden, sort of like chronic depression. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder is sort of the mood symptoms that again circle around in a cyclic fashion around the menstrual period. DSM-5 always wants us to pay attention to the effect of substances on mood and our brain and our functioning. So we have to rule out substance-related disorders or medication-related changes in mood. And we also, together with you, have to pay attention to medical conditions that can be driving. Now, the couple of buckets that we have here would be other specified and unspecified. So primary care practitioners are excellent um, resources. They're well positioned to uh, roll out preventive strategies effectively. So what you do excellently is early identification, universal screening, the PHQ-9 of all children 12 and older. And you have the therapeutic alliance with your children and families. And if you sense that a child and family have gone through a large amount of trauma, trauma is, is, is pervasive, um, especially post-pandemic screening for trauma, sending them on for parental psychotherapy, successful treatment of mothers with depression can really move the trajectory of the youth away from a life of recurrent major depression. The other thing that can be done is potentially identifying and treating anxiety disorders because oftentimes they um, come ahead of depression and major depressive disorder. Lifestyle modification and discussion, and that is always useful, effective management of stress, sleep and exercise, social activity, what gives you meaning, joy, time outside, social media has to be observed and watched. Lab PC tells us that the primary care doctor should be checking for symptoms of depression when the youth tests positive on a formal screen or presents with emotional concerns as the chief complaint. So what happens when you have this occur? Use DSM-5 symptoms and identify how many of those out of nine, does the patient carry and conduct an interview? Rating scales that may be of use to you, all available in the GLAD PC toolkit, PHQ 9, which you're all familiar with because of the universal screening guidelines. As you know, it's modified for teens, and the modification lies in the realm of irritability as well as uh, schoolwork. And it's well validated, respected. The Columbia Depression Scale, a 22 question yes or no scale. Um, and this includes questions about suicidal ideation and attempt. Another briefer scale is the Kutcher Adolescent Depression Scale, six item, quick, good for screening. Columbia Depression Scale parent version. It is important to get the parent perspective. It may be very different from the child perspective. So administering the scale gives you that advantage. You have two perspectives. And this also has questions about suicidal ideation, and planning. The GLAD PC talks about the CGAS, so the Children's Global Assessment Scale. So if you look at this, there are numbers. So their numbers are in clumps of 10, and each of them is a narrative description of the functioning of the kid. So I suggest you take a look at it. It may or may not appeal to you as an easy strategy to use to rate your depression. In which case, I would suggest you also look at the CESDC, so the Center of Epidemiological Studies, Depression in Children. So that's what CESDC stands for. That is available as a free download from the ACAP Depression Resource Center and is a good scale for children aged 6 to 23. Another tool is the QUIDS, uh, ages 13 and older. So that's the Quick Inventory of Depression Scale. So all these scales, you get more and more familiar the more you use it, there is always rating and ranking and um, you know, having that data available and monitoring that data visit to visit is extremely important. So then you move to the assessment. What does that look like? It's a face-to-face -face assessment. Ideally, the youth 
has to have some time with the clinician alone. Some amount of time has to be spent with the parent, some amount together. It's really important to discuss confidentiality with the youth. And that means to say that, you know, everything you say to me is really important and I really want to keep your confidentiality. However, if you tell me things that are indicate to me that you're in danger, you're at risk, somebody else is at risk, then it is my duty to protect you and I'll have to bring mom and dad in. So having that conversation ahead of time preserves the therapeutic alliance when you do it. Questions to be asked from both child and parents. So why are they here? Timeline of symptoms. What's been going on for how long and when did this begin? Current treatment, past treatment. Current and past psychosocial function. So how is this young person doing in school, with the family and in, in society? What are the strengths of the family and of that of the child? Stressful life events. Again, I really want to emphasize and overemphasize the role of adverse childhood experiences and trauma. So tapping into that, can there be any amelioration? Can there be any support provided to the child and family from that end? And then family psychiatric and medical history is also very important. It is important in the interview to evaluate the possible bipolar disorder. And what signals to us that possibility? The family history of bipolar disorder, the child presenting with psychotic symptoms, and that can look like responding to stimuli, you know, uh, active hallucinations, or it can be this child that has slowed down, is not able to answer your questions very clearly, is kind of confused, perplexed, etc. Um, and then to look for subclinical mania, hypomania. And again, the way you can do that is just the DSM checklist. So this is the kid who hasn't met that manic or hypomanic episode, but it's kind of simmering. Medication-induced mania, that's also a concern for the future development of bipolar disorder, and that is important to ask about, to rule out. This is different from activation or disinhibition that develops in about 5 to 10% of children receiving antidepressant treatment. So what this looks like is like a restlessness. So this is the kid who feels like they need to keep shaking their leg or they're just not able to rest at night into a comfortable posture and they're a little more amplified. Bipolar disorder or hypomanic manic episode is much more serious, much more dramatic. So in the interview, it's also important to rule in, rule out comorbidities. And just to complicate the picture, depression is comorbid with many illnesses, anxiety, disruptive behavior disorders, substance abuse, et cetera. And then think through medical conditions as well as medications of the child is on that could be contributing to depressive symptomatology. Risk assessment is very important. So that means risk of suicide, risk of homicide, self-harm. So doing a, a good risk versus risk or risk versus protection is really important. Safety planning is very, very important. Um, you know, sanitizing the environment, making sure guns are not available, making sure that over-the-counter medications are locked, um, making sure belts, et cetera, are not available if there's this risk. So sanitizing that environment is extremely important. So what you're doing here with a risk assessment is really thinking through, do I need to send this child to an emergency room and onward to an inpatient psychiatric hospital? So a good scale to use is the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scales with triage points for primary care. Very, very effective, shouldn't take you too long and gives you a, a flow chart as to move. You know, this is when you need to move towards a behavioral health consultation. So the treatment plan that, that um, is ideally generated is multi-pronged, which means you target biopsychosocially what's going on with the child. And child psychiatrists use the term biopsychosocial very, very often. It's sort of a holistic approach. Collaborative because you want the child to be partnering with the parent and you on treatment because that is what is going to ensure compliance. That is the tenet or the basis of motivation interviewing and moving them forward. Uh, the child, the youth has to give assent, the parents have to give informed consent. Initial management consists of psychoeducation and safety planning. So you are at the best situation to begin this conversation. And it's through you that children and families will learn about depression and how to destigmatize it and how to seek help when it's present um, and not to blame themselves or blame others um, and suffer. Facts for families, again, an ACAP resource, great tool to use in your psychoeducation. Uh, depression Resource Center, also some great tools. What's really important is to alleviate some of the suffering, the stress the child is feeling. So whether it's that at home, 
you know, difficult dynamics, a parent or a grandparent that is critical versus, you know, at school, a child who has got too much homework that is struggling, you know, can we make accommodations just until recovery? So in addition to that, what's really important is the placebo response rate of youth is very high. It's about 50 to 60%. So it's really important to set in those supportive psychotherapy measures. Thinking through depression, you want to think about it in three columns, three categories, mild, moderate, and severe. If you think about mild, um, sort of the symptomatology, the count of symptoms is less than five, so maybe about two or three. Here you want to do a lot with psychoeducation and support and safety planning. When it moves into moderate, that's when you need to move forward into treatment and you need to initiate treatment, refer out to cognitive behavioral therapy and or behavioral health consultation. Severe depression, that is more serious and that is one that I would flag for a referral sooner than later. Safety planning involves several steps. No harm contracts are, uh, are ineffective. So, what safety planning looks like is like, once again, a co-production, right? So that the caregivers and the youth collaboratively work on the safety plan. What that looks like is the clinician asks the youth, can you think through personal warning signs? Can you th think through internal coping strategies? So, you know, when you have those moments of feeling like you want to hurt yourself, what's going on around you? What do you do to take care of yourself? What makes things better? What makes things worse? Identifying social support. So what can you do at that time? Can you, um, who can you talk with? A teacher, a guidance counselor, a parent? Um, can you think about settings that are distracting you? Like for example, a walk in the park, or can you think about music? Um, you then have to identify a trusted adult. And what's really important here is that sometimes they come up with peers and team supports, which is not enough. They need to identify a trusted adult. In addition to that, you have to identify some professional resources like 988, which Dr. Sagar mentioned right up front. Safety of the environment, again, underlining to you, this is extremely important because um, the environment has to be sanitized. Safety planning usually ends on a positive note with reasons to live. Lab PC part two. So we finished part one, which is sort of the assessment. Part two moves more towards treatment. And again, thinking about treatment and thinking about moderate depression. So in moderate depression, you want to focus on how to start the medication, how to titrate it up, and monitor the side effects and track outcomes. So going back again, what is active monitoring? So symptoms of mild depression, you want to actively monitor for about six weeks. I would say more closer to six than eight. Frequent visits, this can be weekly, this can be via telehealth, with exercise, leisure activities, peer support groups, self-management skills, sleep. Um, and then these visits now are easily done through telehealth, providing the uh, patients and families with educational support and safety planning has to be done at every step of the way. So another way to look at it is this sort of arm here, which is active support and monitoring for six to eight weeks. In the middle column is sort of what happens when one heads towards a moderate depression. And what does that mean? It means between six and nine symptoms of depression. So when you're in that category, it's important to start treatment. Um, and this is a medication that's FDA approved and we'll go through how to start and progress it. In addition to that, you want to make that referral to cognitive behavioral therapy, the back of your mind, make that referral soon, make the referral for a behavioral health consultation if you feel like things are getting complicated along the course, but go ahead and start treatment. Severe depression, again, that's where I would move in the direction of referral to uh, mental health or behavioral health. If you've started treatment and you have moved up to the optimum dose and you've let the optimum dose rest for about four weeks to six weeks and you know the child is adherent and you find an improvement, great job. Now continue, maximize the dose, make sure there's good therapy going and you're moving the child towards a remission. If there is marginal improvement, then that's when you want to be concerned. Like, what are we missing? Is adherence happening? You know, is this a treatment resistant depression? Again, at that point, start thinking, should I change medication? Should I refer on to behavioral health? What is going on with therapy, et cetera. If you have successfully moved the patient into remission, what's really important is that you will continue the medication for about a full year after full resolution of symptoms. And it's really important to have follow-ups frequently, at least monthly. 
and you keep that patient in follow-up for a period of one year plus to make sure that they are doing well and the depression stays down under. Three phases of treatment. Acute is to achieve response and remission. So that is just pushing it down. And then continuation and maintenance is sort of keeping up the well-being of the child. Treatment choice is an art and often has many um, aspects to it, the age of the child, cognitive development. Um, you know, you want to bring the child in to, to plan. Severity, chronicity of the symptoms, comorbidities. As I've mentioned, depression is very comorbid. So how are you treating those comorbidities? Family history. Um, you know, if a sibling has responded well to fluoxetine, well, is that my first choice? Um, and then cultural aspects, you know, what is the family dealing with? Do they think it's stigma? Do they think it's their fault? Like, what are, how are they processing it? Working with patient and family preferences, and then, of course, the availability of treatment expertise. So you may have access to behavioral health consultation quickly, or you may not. And how do you navigate that uh, and weave it into your treatment planning? The TADS is a randomized controlled study, um, and it, it's a very well-respected uh, study that really looked at adolescents with depression and treatment with CBT, uh, placebo, and then CBT plus fluoxetine. So this is a long discussion, but when you uh, simplify it, really the combination of CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy and fluoxetine showed a more rapid decline of depressive symptoms and better outcomes. Now, the fact that improvement or clinical improvement was not very significant just tells us that depression is complicated. You know, the symptoms may come down, but then life and how the patient adjusts to life is also equally important. And that again speaks to the importance of therapy. Combination treatment is really where we need to head if we're thinking about mild to moderate depression. Psychotherapy, there are two forms of psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. So when you hear your patient is working with um, thinking errors or automatic thought records or behavioral activation, then you know that they're doing cognitive behavioral therapy. Interpersonal therapy has efficacy for adolescents. And really what that focuses on is the interpersonal realm of that adolescent, because adolescents are so sensitive and uh, needing validation from their peers. So with regard to pharmacotherapy, now, the response rate is 61% for SSRIs and 50% for placebo. So just no placebo response rates, very high, important to have supportive management, cognitive behavioral therapy, et cetera. Fluoxetine is effective, has been studied. Venlafaxine or Epexor may be better for older children, but for younger children, uh, it, the most side effects. So when you're choosing these medications, it's good to have one with a long half-life because pharmacokinetics for Little children is different from older children and they may have brief periods of withdrawal and struggle if you give them something that has a short half-life. So bottom line here, fluoxetine um, is, it has been effective, venlafaxine may have some side effects, tricyclics have no efficacy. Side effects, the most important one that I wanna cover is maybe parental concern that my child is going to get worse. So it's suicidal ideation and more suicide attempts. So what I want to underline here is that in reanalysis of the FDA data. Um, and they looked at this thoroughly and widely, right? So for major depressive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorder, the pooled risk difference for new or increased spontaneously reported suicidal ideation or suicidal behaviors for all antidepressants to be 0.7%. So when you think about 0.7%, that is not a zero. So there is some risk, but if you look at the broad data, increased use of SSRIs has contributed to the dramatic decline of adolescent suicide. After black box warning, when primary care practitioners stopped prescribing SSRIs, suicide rates increased. So the sum total of all of this is positive relationship between SSRI and suicide reduction, but there needs to be close monitoring when we start the antidepressant, when we increase the dose. So again, my thought is we have the access to telehealth, set up frequent visits and do frequent check-ins. So the treatment typically is start low, go slow. You can potentially begin with five to 10 milligrams of fluoxetine, increase in increments of five to 10 milligrams and come to a dose of about 40 milligrams uh, and keep that on board for four to six weeks. FDA approvals, fluoxetine or Prozac, ages six and older, 
S-cytalopram or Lexapro, ages 12 and older. So GLAD pc has great recommendations in terms of starting doses, how to increase it. But again, think through fluoxetine 5 to 10 milligrams, gradually increase it by increments of 5 to 10. See the patient weekly, monitor for side effects, monitor for activation, monitor for mania, monitor for suicidality, and just keep going. And if things are improving, you may be able to secure a remission. Um, and again, throughout this whole journey, supportive planning, safety planning, and cognitive behavioral therapy are great adjuncts. So that journey can also be taken with a cytalopram. Again, here you start with five milligrams and increase by increments of five milligrams. There are other medications mentioned here, which you feel, which you're free to look at and obtain from the GLAD PC toolkit. Start low, go slow, see them frequently. Um, seeing them frequently is more checking in on them, right? Response has to be assessed only at four weeks. So see them frequently, but assess response at four weeks. And make sure you're at the right dose for the right period of time. And in 12 weeks, our goal should be remission. And again, monitor for suicidal thoughts and behavior and see the youth weekly for four weeks, bi-weekly afterwards, use telehealth, um, phone contact, et cetera. So the toolkit monitoring is really helpful. You can take a look at that. You know, it's, it's very clearly delineated with date, assessment, mode of interview, scores, et cetera. So a very useful, simple way of documenting what you're seeing in the child week by week after you've started the antidepressant. Depression is recurrent, uh, relapses high. And so it's really important to monitor even after the symptoms have been pushed under and remission has occurred. So monitor for about one year after the full remission of symptoms and um, when medication needs to be tapered off, do so gradually, do so in a period of stability like summer when there's no uh, external stressor. School is a stressor for most kids. So um, a time away from school, away from emotionally laden periods of time is good. So what's really important is that, um, as I mentioned before, depression is recurrent and heavy. Resistant depression is pretty common. The first thing that I would encourage is to make sure there's adherence. There's going to be another venue for us to talk about treatment-resistant depression and maybe treatment-resistant anxiety and some complications, which we will do soon. I just want to quickly reference a study called the NIMH TORDIA study, again, publicly funded, granted. Um, and really the lesson from this study is that if symptoms of depression continue to exist and you've made sure of adherence, made sure of dose, made sure of time, potentially switching to another SSRI, but making sure that cognitive behavioral therapy in its true form is in place. So more data on how to taper down in your GLAD PC toolkit. And when you refer out is when A, you're in an emergent situation, which I've defined before, suicide, homicide, psychosis, when depression is severe, heavy and unremitting. And when you tried one to two SSRIs with robust cognitive behavioral therapy that hasn't worked after a period of four to six weeks. Okay, so now we're going to go to our case, and I'm going to read this case out, and we're going to elicit your thoughts. So this is a 12-year-old male brought in by his mother due to decreased energy level and headaches. He wants to sleep or be alone in his room. He loses his temper easily. He got very upset at a friend's birthday party, and mom had to bring him home. He has a difficult relationship with dad, frequent arguments. School phoned and said they're worried about him. He's struggling academically. He's just started seventh grade. He used to play baseball, but now is not interested in signing up. Mom is worrying that he's using drugs. He says no. He lives at home with his mother, father, and two sisters. They recently have lost a pet six months ago. During the interaction that Jerry has, he looks flat, tearful, looks away, and has dark circles under his eyes. And he tells you, I can never get to sleep. I'm tired all the time. Everything is bad. I wish life did not suck. So this is your case, and I'm going to ask us to open up and to brainstorm and discuss what thoughts you may have with regard to this patient. Thank you, Dr. Ranga. A fantastic presentation. I invite everybody to unmute, turn on your cameras. Let's walk through this case together. 
Um, so please go ahead. And if you want to chime in via chat, uh, by all means, you can do that as well. What questions do you have about the case that I just presented or that just we, we had on the screen? So if this were an exam, you'd be looking at the six month time frame from the pet passing away and you know less than six months, more than six months as far as a reactive depression. But it certainly in the presentation sounds like he is significantly more um, I, depressed than you would expect for it having been six months ago. So it does seem like you would be concerned that he was truly depressed. Yes, completely. And as I mentioned earlier, the quality of grief is different. It sort of circles around the loss. Whereas when it moves into major depressive disorder, you know, the mood becomes more pervasively grumpy or irritable or depressed and it starts affecting um, school and thinking and, and you know, negative self-worth. And it just becomes much bigger than symptomatology that circle the loss. Does that make sense? So definitely we're looking at something that's bigger and something that's definitely in the realm of moderate. Any other thoughts we would have on this case? Or any questions at all, any, anything at all? This, this is Gary Greenswag. I'm, uh, I asked this question last hour, but I'm going to just maybe ask you to opine on it again, because I, I think it's helpful, uh, just the context of um, how you manage interviewing the child, um, uh, it, it, particularly, I think in a lot of these cases that the child is probably the, the parents may be full of information and the child may like be are not talking. And so how, how you kind of manage that. And I know that you kind of separate the parents from the child for a bit to have a one on one. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I think this is where I think translation between like a pediatrician's office and a child psychiatrist's office, there's a big difference between the two. Um, so what I do typically and what's taught um, sort of in child and adolescent psychiatry fellowships is really trying to figure out a patient-centered, developmentally-centered interview. So um, a semi-structured interview which taps into the whole child. So for example, I know in my mind the parents have brought the child in for symptom depression. I may not want to start with that. I may want to start with developing a therapeutic alliance with the child and say, Hey, Jerry, how are you doing today? Tell me a little bit about you. What school do you go to? So I want to think about the child's life in three domains. So starting with school is usually a safe place because they tell you where their school is at, what their favorite subject is. But through that domain, I get understanding of why academic struggles may be happening. Through that domain, I get an understanding of how uh, peer interactions are happening. Is there bullying? You know, what may be happening in that domain? And then gradually, I would move into the domain of a home. So tell me a little bit about home and maybe have, a, have them draw a picture of their home with me and say, who lives here? And um, does it, you know, do you know what the word safe means? Uh, what does that mean? Does this home feel safe? Um, you know, and tell me two things about mom. You know, what do you adore about her? What, a, you know, what do you love about her? What are special? And then if you had a magic wand, what would you change about mom? That way you get more information about you know, potentially the child telling you, you know, mom has been really down since the death of the dog and has been in her room crying. So you get a sense of what's happening like a fly on the wall at home. And then you move into saying, hey, now Jerry, it's about you and you're the most important person in the room. So I'm gonna to talk to you about you. So, um, you know, again, what makes you happy? Very simple language is what we use because many of our mm -hmm. kids come in with emotional language difficulties. So happy, sad, mad, scared. And we shared in the previous presentation that all my fellows have this sort of uh, faces, you know, you have culturally sensitive, different kinds of faces. You bring that to the room and say, hey, what, where, what do you think you feel like right now? And have them sort of start pointing out that happy, sad, mad, scared, and identifying what those stressors are. Through that, you're beginning to build that bridge between yourself and this young person. And, and then you can actually, you'll have more of an opening to delve into sort of things like self-harm and et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. So, so yes, and you, the other thing you mentioned, Dr. Greenspike, is having some time with the child alone is really important. Um, the older they are, I think the more important it is because you know we see tension in the room when mom and dad are there and then when mom and dad leave, the adolescent 
relaxes a little bit. Now, although as adults, we're always kind of not cool with them, um, it, it's still a relaxation compared to when mom and dad were new. With younger kids who are worried to separate, I may keep them together, but then I would frame the same questions, but do it more in a co-production way with the parents. That's fantastic. And I think it's very helpful for a lot of us who are practicing medicine to understand like, how do we craft this conversation without going at it head on, uh, which may not be very helpful. I think one of the things that a lot of us struggle with is, should we start medical treatment? Should we refer this patient to therapy and wait on the medical treatment? Like, yes. How would you go about this case? So my, yeah, with this case, I would definitely report this as a, as a major depressive episode landing in the area of moderate, which is exactly what we're talking about right now. And when I teach about recurrent depression, I uh, show a picture of like the bullet train, right? So which means that we've got to be quick. We've got to get in there, get the depression out of the system because that prevents recurrence and lingering depression. So moderate depression gets started with treatment. That's your best chance of pushing it out of the system and restoring the young person back to their normal developmental trajectory, right? So start the medication, start low, go slow, monitor frequently, put in that referral to cognitive behavioral therapy and or consultation. So you have that kind of cooking as you're beginning the treatment and watching and optimizing the dose. That's very helpful. Other questions that folks have, or maybe cases that uh, if you wanted to mm -hmm run by, this is a good time. We'll ask for you to remove any uh, patient identifying details from your case stem, but. I also welcome Dr. Aurora, who is my colleague who will be participating next time. And so she's also an expert um, here that can weigh in if you have any questions or cases. Hi, this was really helpful. I'm Lilia Pararodi, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. It's it's nice to meet you. Um, I think, uh, you know, we tend, like I'm trying to transition from a model where, you know, I, I do some initial things and then refer out to trying to do more of this myself. And I think, uh, you know, there's like trying to feel like you're, you're, you can do it efficiently um in the context and i don't know if you have or have already counseled a few primary care physicians that that have made that transition from not doing this and feeling like this is not my <laughs> my lane i have to transfer out and and granted i've seen lots of teens over the years and um and i think i do manage more than but typically if i'm thinking medications that's where I, I stop. Um, so I don't know if you have like any words of wisdom regarding that. Um, and I am anticipating a very interesting case next week, which, which, which I could like briefly touch upon, but I don't have all the details. So, um, but, uh, but mom called me um, about her daughter who I've seen for many years um, and was very concerned. And, and I'm, kind of concerned as well too like um so yeah so a couple of thoughts that i have and then i let um others weigh in um you know i think my um my hats off really to primary care doctors who are navigating uh you know a large swath of patients seeing them frequently but what you have as your strength is that therapeutic alliance so getting patients on board the treatment um you know, is, is potentially easier for you than for us who are sort of on the outside and we have to establish that therapeutic alliance and talk about medications, et cetera. So you're well poised, I think, to potentially start uh, discussing medications. Um, and I think the question is really sort of what would be the barrier to like starting, um, you know, fluoxetine, for example, at a low dose of five milligrams and setting up those frequent follow-ups uh, and just sort of exploring those barriers and seeing what kind of supports you can uh, construct sort of within the practice. So that's what GLAD PC, the first aspect of it, is focused on is sort of the practice ways in which um, things can be modified in order to facilitate the, that transition to actually starting the medication, monitoring, et cetera. Hmm. 
And I think that um, I worked at a children's hospital for many years before I moved to Creighton. I was at the Bonner Children's in Memphis. And um, we would we started sort of a collaborative care model and just had lunch and learns. And the way we had our lunch and learns was with pediatrics presenting cases because we didn't do PowerPoints and presentations. We just discussed what, what would you do? So having those informal kind of connections in the community with mental health, I think is a good way to. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah, the case I have, it, uh, mom called me a week ago, a 16 year old who um, got pregnant, had an abortion. This was in May. Uh, the dad doesn't know. The mother knows, but the teenager is experiencing all kinds of changes in behavior, including um, you know, mom, I guess, had severe postpartum depression when she had her, and she's telling her mom that she never wanted her. Um, so these are these are the things that are coming out, and she's mad at the pet, wants them to get rid of their pet, um, just anger, lashes. The, the dad said, we need to get her help, doesn't know at, at all what's going on. And she's coming in for a well check next week. <laughs> Yes. So along with her five-year-old sister and the, and she's 16. So, um, uh, so I, at that point, um, I, it's like, I'm starting from scratch with her because she actually didn't want me to tell her that, uh, she'd met, she wanted some resources cause she was going to actually try to, to call. And so I did give her, um, behavioral health resources. So she may have already done something with that. Uh, but but it sounds like an acute episode because before this, she'd never had any depression. She never had any behavioral issues. Um, and uh, so. Yes, I would definitely screen this patient, uh, Dr. Paroid, with um, for, for suicidal thinking with the Columbia yeah. suicide. Yeah. Because it sounds like a depression. Again, that's heavy ruminative blaming and not worth it. So, and sometimes those thoughts are deep within. And you know, I think screening for that and seeing if we're at a higher level of acuity than you know, potentially comes across, that would be definitely one thought. Um, and definitely this is one where we would need medication management given the family history um, yeah. and the, the hormonally vulnerable stage she's in as well as, oh my gosh, such a huge loss and adjustment. Yeah. So definitely a combination of sort of the medication plus the cognitive behavioral therapy. The medication again pushes that that neurovegetative thing out, which then makes the uh, makes the youth able to do the therapy, do the work, do the homework, and cope better. Okay, well that thank you. <laughs> thank you. I think that's such a wonderful way that you sort of explain the role of medications, because I think we could we could potentially get. Our, especially our adolescent patients on board with the idea that it's not necessarily going to just take away everything, um, but the medication is just to help with the idea that, you know, it'll get you back to the things that you want to do Absolutely. and things you enjoy doing. Absolutely. And again, going back to that development, you know, what adolescents are really sensitive about is they want to be like their peers. So they don't want to be the other. And so making it about the fact that, you know, so many kids are depressed and this is about getting you back to your, to you and to your best version um, and taking away blame and there's nothing wrong with you. Oftentimes that really helps. And the other analogy that we give is, you know, if you break a leg, you have physical therapy and that's going to help you kind of finally get back your skills and walk. And then you have the pain medications, which makes the pain go away. So you sort of adjunctively do that to heal. So, you know, having those analogies simplified for people is often very helpful. Well, this has been a great session. Thank you so much, Dr. Ranga. We really appreciate it. We will be sharing the recording with everybody. So more to come on that. Um, and we will attach some of the guidelines that Dr. Ranga mentioned so that everybody has easier access to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us.